also of the kind of sound. And I did. Does, does any of that click with you? Or? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a comment rather than a Yeah, but I mean, did you look at an artist like Flavin, you know, with interest, or was that just something that was also happening? Um, I guess um, I was kind of annoyed at uh, abstract art at the time. I felt uh, it was uh, kind of boring and, like, not very exciting to me. I mean, it was, I mean, I'm just speaking con con uh, you know, confidentially, I, I've changed my, <laughs> my I've changed my opinions at times uh, since then. You know, but uh, th at that moment, I have to say, I found a lot of uh, sort of um, mm, abstract art to be uh, trying pretty hard and not really delivering very much for me. So I would say, no, I wasn't really that uh, tied into it. But I wasn't really tied into Times Square very much either. I was a little jaded on that account, I would say, because uh, when I uh, completed um, uh, Straight and Narrow, I was actually living a block from Times Square. I lived on 42nd Street at that time, between, uh, Broad you know, like they always say, the center of the universe is Broadway and 42nd Street. Yeah, I was down the block, so, you know, that was where my... <laughs> loft was. So uh, it uh, had struck me that it was an interesting neighborhood to live in because, um, I mean, after I lived there, you know, like, okay, I can live in Buffalo now, you know. <laughs> it's like, you don't have to go to the middle of anything after that. And, um, and uh, I liked uh, the fact that, it, as it turned out, this was a... Um, a city that was um, that 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 moved in every day, every morning, and moved out every night. You know, so that there was a, a sort of the resident population of this neighborhood was sort of like really small. It was very peculiar because it was almost like living in the desert, but then having hordes of locusts come <laughs> every day. You know, like up out of the subways they would come. <laughs> <laughs> So, that, for example, when I noticed, uh, when I read an article about asbestos pollution and I saw um, asbestos uh, falling on my uh, uh, windowsill from uh, this 33-story uh, uh, neighbor <laughs> that they were building, um, I uh, called my assembly person, you know. I thought, jeez, this is like no good to have in the nave here. And I realized there's no, you know, hardly anybody lived there. You know, I mean, so who's going to complain? It's, he was, so he was my representative, you know, and there's probably not very many people living in that area except a transient hotel, you know, and so, so I call my representative, I say, you know, there's this best is falling down here. He said, send me the information. I sent it to him and, um, sh you know, within a couple of years, he was um, appointed to be, uh, the head of the Environmental Protection Administration in New York, which also happened to be head of sanitation. So when I needed the water turn on in Times Square for a project I wanted to do, I called up by Jerome Kretschmer. He was a nice Democrat, liberal, liberal Democrat, and he said, uh, anything you want. <laughs> Uh, so, I, I felt good about this because of, of uh, the, the, I also called the uh, head of the uh, 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 ma uh, Manufacturers Association and other people to try to stem this asbestos thing even at that time, you know, which was really early in the game. This is way off the answer. <laughs> No, you got it. That was a comment, and this is just sort of like that. So you got a, some kind of story too. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things you have said about the flicker at the time, the going on what you said before about being against the abstract ethos yeah. at the time. You say in this program notes from '67 that um, that uh, you want it to be a movie. Yes, yeah, like and to do like a, what a movie does, which is to yeah. transport you somewhere else. Yeah. And that seems to me to be so related to the opening sequence, the, the, the title sequence, mm -hmm. which is so Jack Smith-like. 
Mm -hmm. Right? Because of the, in certain ways, it's different in many ways, but also it has that sort of moldy aesthetic of, yeah, the, sort yeah. of the old, you know, and the handwritten signs and, and things. And, um, and so, it, I mean, it makes perfect sense in some ways, too, of this coming out of the, you know, Ludlow Street oh, yes. um, experiments with, with Smith, because in some ways it's Jack Smith without creatures. <laughs> right, because it's yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's flickering light and shadow, and which is one of the things that Smith says in 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 uh, perfect uh, filmic appositeness of Maria Montez. He says mm -hmm. a good film flickers in light and shadow. Mm -hmm. Is one of the things that he says about uh, that early Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. But did you expect? Did you expect people? Did you expect people to think at the beginning of that Smith? Because it's interesting also that when you did Straight and Narrow, it starts with some flicker. So it's like uh -huh. <coughs> reminding people, you know, this is 1970 or something, it's mm -hmm. reminding people of the notorious Flickr film, right, in some way. Well, so it, uh, it wasn't uh, necessarily a visual reminder so much as just the, the fact that the whole film is, act is cut uh, out oh, of two. Flicker, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, three dark frames out of every six. You know, so it, it you can't. I mean, you, you it couldn't do what it does without flickering. Yeah, you know? and I was interested in um, in seeing what else could be done using this sort of flickering light as a medium, as a as a as a device, as a material. You know, to where where could it be taken from that point? And uh, uh, particularly in terms of uh, the um, kinds of uh, it was it was interesting that that uh, the uh, the different um, uh, you, what you might call hallucinatory qualities of the flicker seemed to be more very uh, like to a, to some degree in, in the under the control of the viewer and I was I, in designing the film I was uh, really sort of trying to exercise this function of control in a kind of diabolical way. You know, I thought, okay, I want to make it very, very slow so that people will think like, yeah, there's nothing going on. Hey, nothing happened. You know, like, what's this? What's the noise? You know, hey, hey, hey. And, you know, just inevitably, invariably, like, you know, like, uh, like, just ratchet it up just like this until it just goes like, whoa, you know, like that. And then take it away, you know, so that it's like, you thought you were doing this. Yeah, no, you're not doing it. I'm, the film is doing it, you see. Uh, but then it did turn out that there's an enormous variability. People have saw all different kinds of things and have had all different kinds of reports, which we could hear if we all exchanged you know, impressions. And um, like, uh, I don't know, if any, did anybody sort of imagine they saw like objects or animals or flowers or numbers or letters or scenes? Yeah. Some, yeah, that happens, and uh, I mean, the best viewers see this stuff. I showed it in a class once at UCI. Seriously? And uh, had, you know, the whole class was very intellectually engaged, right? They're listening to me do this stuff like you did. And, but one student, it like, you know, if it really is the alpha way to do it, just hit her, right? And she was like, you guys didn't see? There were birds, and there were, I mean, she was really, you know, she's probably had a breakdown now. But, but she was like yeah. an ideal viewer for the film. A lot of people see things, yeah. and, and particularly uh, uh, patterns of uh, rotating uh, colors and stuff yeah. like this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that. And so um, I uh, thought, well, it would be wonderful to be able to program the color effects because uh, there was a person who uh, did a study of this um, uh, film at NYU to and sort of like showed it to experimental <coughs> groups, you know, like to and then have them fill out questionnaires. You know. And uh, it turned out that the more colors people saw, the more one marvelous their experience was. The people who didn't who had a bad experience didn't see any colors and they didn't hated it and they didn't see anything. You know. But the people who were relaxed and happy and like enjoyed it, saw lots of colors, <laughs> sort of a weird thing. But anyway, so I thought, well, this would be interesting to try to regulate this. And then I uh, happened to read in the, in the newspaper one day that 
someone in Los Angeles had put a commercial on the air. This is in, in you know, like it, this is in the 60s. You, you know, they didn't have color TV. So they put a commercial on the air that came out in color. And I thought, oh, whoa, wait, what's this? You know, so I started to investigate and I found, uh, I started to investigate the different phenomena that were um, possible, uh, that could be produced using black and white uh, images and, and so forth to generate subjective color. And uh, so there's this uh, well-known thing called Benham's Top, which uh, is a little gizmo and you spin it around and like it has little stripes on it. <laughs> and the little stripes look colored depending on which, and the, the color changes depending on which way you spin the top. And I thought, heck, <laughs> here we go. I'm going to make a film with stripes and it's going to be, I'll just copy this disc pattern. See, it's half black and then it has like three sections. So I just make six frames and then it'll be three black. And then I can put the stripes in this section, that section, and the other section. And they'll have, and they'll begin to look you know, orange, green, or blue. And uh, sure enough, so this, this was already a, a very much a part of the idea, you know, was to sort of, um, somehow I imagine that it might be eventually possible to make uh, color movies using black and white film, you know, which would be like, <laughs> whoa, you know, but that never, 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 you never got that far. It's a little hard, to, just difficult to do. I think today with um, uh, contemporary uh, um, uh, computer image tools, it should be like pretty possible to do this kind of thing, and it would be fun to see it happen. But see now, who's going to mess around with black and white uh, computer images? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> just to follow up on your diabolical ratcheting and, and, to, and to get something from a kind of flavor of, of the time period. You know, I've always thought of kind of the alternative cultures of the 60s as no um, stranger to the ple pleasure principle. But when it came to film and music and theater, it almost seemed like part of avant-garde credential was how punishing you could make something. <laughs> you know, where did this disjuncture happen? <laughs> that credibility was in the punitive. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, that's really a very interesting, uh, uh, very, very interesting um, uh, sort of uh, a question because it uh, kind of reveals a uh, kind of conservative bent on your part. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, like uh, by the time I had been making this uh, film, I had been uh, playing uh, really loud music for several years and um, and it had turned out that when you got the music really loud, that it just began to sound really, really good. And uh, some people found it painful. <laughs> but, you know, when you sort of get away from that cultural conditioning and go into this space, then it turns out it's amazing and wonderful. And, uh, uh, there were a couple of other areas where the uh, gang of folks that I was involved with during those per that period of time uh, uh, liked that kind of thing, like uh, this is, uh, maybe it's tinged with masochism, I don't know, but like hot food, you know how hot food is? You crank it up and you get it up there to a certain point and I'm sorry, it's fabulous, you know, but... Yeah, you gotta, you know, like you talk to somebody who's not used to it, and they're really like thinking, like, God, no, my lord, you know. But then you get to the point where you find this Indonesian recipe for pickled chili peppers, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's intense. You know? So uh, I don't know what the analog would be in terms of um, like painting or print culture. You know, to uh, turning up the game to pain. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. No, there's definitely the analog to seriousness. 
reduction, you know, which has been talked yeah. about, which you even talked about in relationship to, to this film, you know, at some point. Yeah. Talked about it in terms of relationship to, there was some, something you gave me in the research where there's a review and somebody says, you know, this film, oh, it's just, it's nothing. It's like, the, it's like monochrome painting. And you have written next to it, best critique so far. Nineteen sixty nine or something. So, you know, I guess that would be one. Is there a question? There was a hand that was going way. Yeah, I was going to uh, try to uh, use this whole idea of feedback uh, that you were talking about, uh, which is you know very uh, timely with the you know fifties and sixties, and uh, try to get Tony to talk about things like uh, you know network, social networks, and um, you know because. I, you know, all the efforts you put into public access television, it seems to have been, you know, now everybody has a video on YouTube uh, now, and yeah. uh, it's, you know, sort of, uh, in a way, it's a nightmare realizing your dream. Um, is there some way to introduce some positive feedback to this to just explode it? Can you explain how, please? <laughs> I mean, you're talking about YouTube today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> it, it is very interesting, and I think... Um, uh, I think the, uh, the, perhaps the answer is that um, in some ways uh, this may end up turn to, to be a self-regulating uh, system in that uh, uh, people will uh, become exhausted at some point by the fact that, that everything on YouTube sucks. You know, and uh, there will be a mechanism which will then regulate that. You know, and uh, and uh, I I suspect I suspect I mean this is all speculative, you know, but this is what I would suspect would would finally occur, and uh, um, when we look ahead to in other words like there'll be um, voting or you know like already there's the best you know the best one of the week you you know you like the best picks and the most played and so forth and and, and that kind of thing, and this may this may be headed toward the answer to that problem. Uh, but I think what you need to be watchful about is if you can see this coming, as you do so clearly, then what we have to be wary of is the fact that, it's, uh, it, that there's an open opportunity for advertisers and companies to co-opt those mechanisms of control and become a part of that scheme and then you know the whole thing sort of becomes uh, kind of frustrating and familiar uh, because uh, uh, you, you, you know this happened in radio broadcasting in the 20s uh, where you know like it was unregulated at first of course and you could you know anybody who wanted to, who could build a station basically could get on and then anybody could pick it up and so forth and, and uh, and so the, uh, the regulation of the airwaves became the, the opening for uh, um, the uh, corporations to take it over. One of the things that's interesting, if you look, if, if I can just, if you look historically at what's going on around the flicker, like literally around 65, 66, because the film is really should be dated 65, 66, yeah, yeah. Like well into production in 65, and actually it is dated 65 and something. Things is um, one that, as a mechanism, strobe, right, is coming out of World War II laboratories. This is W. Barry Walters bringing this out of World War II laboratories. And right at that time, 64, 65, 66, there is this sort of big social struggle about perception that happens. So in 1964, you have the, the New York World's Fair. And the New York World's Fair has these things that have become very famous now. Well, one of them is it's a small world after all, actually. It was the 1964 World's Fair. Um, but that you had things like the Eames is doing the multi-screen projections at the IBM Pavilion, um, which were attempts by uh, the Eameses and the IBM Corporation to, to take the technology that had been developed literally for command and control centers in World War II and to deploy it for consumption. Right? So can we get people, how can we get people to not just like consume one screen, but to be able to consume, consume 10 or 15 screens? And the reason it becomes interesting when you look at things like the Flickr is that 
it drove Jonas Mikas at that time, who's running, you know, the, you know, one of the big impresarios of the, of the, of um, filmmaking at that time, and actually who helps finance the Flickr, um, sort of crazy, right? Because he 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 reviews all of this stuff in '64, and sort of has this realization that like, whoa, the avant-garde is a little behind the corporations here, and so within the next year organizes the new cinema festival, which goes down in history as the Expanded Cinema Festival, even though that wasn't the name, which at which um, Tony and Lamont and Marion, the Theater of Eternal Music, played. I think it's the first place the lights shows were done on, the projections were done on um, the Theater of Eternal Music. And so there's this sort of cultural battle over attention that happens in 65, 66, of which I think the flicker is part of that in some way, to sort of do something. At least that was the way that Mikas, because Mikas took it around to, to college campuses and showed it and things. And already by 67, um, Mikas is saying, um, people have caught up. Like, I, like, it used to drive everybody out, and now they ask to see it a second time. And so there's this sort of, you know, sort of a jockeying around, like, what people are going to see and how much they're going to see and, and whether it's going to be enjoyable or whether it's going to be sort of, you know, I mean, because things like the Eames thing are really, I mean, technologically very interesting, but ideologically really dull. You know, there's things like, you know, babies and, you know, <laughs> blowing out candles and, you know, stuff like that. So there's this, like, real sort of hallmark quality versus this sort of, you know, the flicker starts in a sort of, sort of undercutting its own nefariousness, yeah? It's like, you know, disclaiming liability for physical or mental injury, which, of course, makes you think that you might get one of those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a system of deliberately a system of contradictions that is that, that it's sort of presented in this very you went you said it's like an old-timey movie or it has this Jack Smithy effect but uh, uh, I, I was sort of thinking of it as um, like a calming cal sort of like a you know like a very pleasant moment you know with just like familiar old-timey titles and you know and then, uh, so that it'd be like, you know, just casual and nothing, and sort of allow, allow a stasis to hit. Because I really wanted the audience to look at the text. And by the way, I apologize for the text. This, this particular print was uh, made in a defective way, and I like the, the flicker part, but the title part is actually, was, was made incorrectly, so you lost the bottom line that says a physician should be in attendance, and I, I apologize for that. But I, you know, I wanted people to look at this carefully, you know, because I wanted them to be uh, worried <laughs> and reassured at the same time, you know. But I also did really feel that there was a, uh, a, a very small but appreciable uh, danger that some individual who uh, was uh, prone to photogenic epileptic seizure might have a seizure and that then, you know, uh, this would be really bad. And so the question was, should I alert people that this could go and drive people to a seizure or not? And I talked to, uh, I talked to a doctor who uh, was actually head of the uh, seizure clinic at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And he said, he advised against having a warning notice. He said a lot of the people who come to him with claims that they're epileptic just aren't epileptic. They just think it's like glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you can be epileptic and not have any symptoms, you know. So it's sort of like, oh yeah, I think I'm real. I'm, you know, I'm, Oh, I have seizures. You know. <laughs> so he said I would be more likely to have hysterical epilepsy in, a, in that sense than uh, regular epilepsy. If I alert people, they have a chance to be epileptic. Then they'll, they'll do. You know, they'll, they'll do it. You know. <laughs> but uh, I decided differently. I decided that it would be better to actually be. Um, you know, like uh, uh, legitimately concerned and let people know so they could leave and give them time to leave too. Yeah.
we shot it at the at the Getty when I was out in LA and I was going to give a talk and I decided to show the show the film and of course the Getty with a whole phalanx of lawyers. They had people like they were handing out the notice to people as they were coming in. <laughs> they had to sign stuff and they had a whole other level. <coughs> whole other level to uh, see. And then they didn't turn down the lights when they showed it. Okay. So there was like no effect. It yeah. was a real <laughs> <laughs> they got what they deserved. <coughs> the Getty uh, is this place where, in order to get in, you have to go past the guard post and <laughs> park your car are underground in a They're very uh, concerned. bunker. <laughs> <laughs> They're very That's a weird place. Yeah, it is very weird. But they were good. They got it very quickly uh -huh. on the show. Yeah. So, um, yeah. What was I going to say? Uh, uh, I forget. Maybe there's some other com a comment. There's one in the back. Oh. Yeah, question, uh, who did the music for uh, Strain and Euro? Oh yeah, uh, it, this is one of these things where uh, you get um, uh, um, sort of uh, captured by the first music you hear when you finish a film. It's really bizarre, but this can happen. And I warn any filmmakers, you know, to watch out when you finish your film. That the first music you hear may seem to be the perfect music, you know. In this case, I think it worked out okay. But uh, my friend John Cale had been working with Terry Riley at Columbia on an album that's called Church of Anthrax. And uh, so he had just finished mixing this two nights of March. Uh, and, um, that, and, and Columbia was in Midtown. I was on 42nd Street. And he dropped by and he said, oh, I've just finished this like great song, you know, and like uh, I said, well, let's hear it. I said, I just got come back from the lab with my great, with my movie, you know, like, let's just do them together. <laughs> <laughs> so I put on my movie and he put on his sound, his, uh, his thing, and I, I meant, it was just like, oh, God, I can't do anything about it now. <laughs> <laughs> the soundtrack to, to Straight and Narrow is still available. It's still in print. You can get it. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's still, yeah. Uh -huh. So it's like uh, these guys from uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears who are playing on there. And I don't have any rights to the material, you know, but who cares? You know? <laughs> Is there a, a relationship between ocular pets and the flicker? I mean, can you draw some sort of thread? No, I think that's a little of a stretch. I wouldn't uh, go that far. Um, actually, but it's question? an interesting idea. But like over 40 <coughs> years. <coughs> he was uh, t uh, asking about a, uh, a video that was shown last night, which is uh, like about, uh, what, uh, a year old, and this is uh, 40 years old. Uh, I'm a completely different person. Maybe I'm responsible for this, but only, you know, I mean, well, you, you saw a couple of, he showed pictures of different people who were, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I can't I can't say it's the same person. So. I love to change. Yeah. You know, I think I think one of the greatest things about art is that it, it's like uh, uh, in the way. Uh, oh, oh. Sorry. Go on for a long time. <laughs> That's going uh, to change some of the molecules in your body right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can change. Uh, 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 art art uh, does allow, uh, provide opportunities for you to change your mind and, and in, in fact encourages a kind of renewal, a process of renewal. Although there are a lot of artists who get stuck. Can I ask you a question about change? Yeah. Because one of the things that's interesting in the history of the Flickr, right, is the Flickr's made, made 65, 66, shown in 66, all of a sudden in 1969, it's a structural film. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and it's and it's not only is it a structural film, right, but in P. Adams initial article on structural film, it's really the structural film. The structural film. Like, yeah. The structural film comes to be wavelength. But in the first article, yeah. the structural film is the flicker, right? The one that gets talked about the most. And and the most articulate spokesperson of the structural Film tendency is cited to be you, although, and you're, and he's quoting from you talking about static form, which is something that's common to um, this film, but also to the work that you're doing. Um, 
And in a certain, in a certain way, you don't talk about it as a structural film. But then at a certain point, there are times when you do talk about a structural film. There's an interview with you in 1972 talking um, to a French uh, um, festival organizer and basically explaining what structural film is. You say, well, there's three ways you can look at this, and one is a structural film, and then there's another, and there's another. And then, of course, later you go on to do performances and things explicitly thinking about structural film and trying to sort of destroy structural film or take it to the end. Yeah. I mean, at what point did you start to engage with structural film? Did you, did you go through changes and think, oh, structural film, that's a good idea, I like that idea, and then now I don't like it, or, or was it useful in some way for a certain project? I mean, how did you interact with it? Well, I, I, I could be uh, very honest, and uh, I, could, I could actually lie, but I could be very honest and, and uh, say that um, when this... Uh, the idea of structural film was first uh, introduced, it, it, I, it associated me with a group of people that I didn't really know, and I didn't really, you know, like whose work I didn't really know very much, uh, namely uh, uh, Michael Snow, Hollis Frampton, Ernie Gare, uh, and so forth and so on. And, uh, <coughs> About the only one I really knew was uh, Ken Jacobs, and of course the way I knew Ken Jacobs was through uh, Jack Smith, and Ken Jacobs was somebody who made a really bizarre and extremely rewarding film called Blonde Cobra, which uh, featured uh, Jack Smith, and uh, there was a, there, the uh, stratum of film that I had co come in on and been involved with was one that was in, in, dedicated to excess, to indulgence, to uh, extremes, to uh, uh, florid uh, life expression, and so forth. And uh, so now I'm being associated somehow with a group of people whose films are sort of very chin uh, you know, rubbing and uh, uh, stroking, <coughs> as chin strokers and. Uh, and uh, sedate, you know, films that uh, sort of don't do anything. And I thought, uh, I don't know, I don't really even like these films. I, they, they're, they're pretty bad, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I was, I was like quite disaffected by that work uh, in that way uh, for a while. But uh, I got to know one or two of the people who were involved. And uh, in particular, like Ernie Gare, and I began to uh, see interesting things in their work. There's a, a piece, for example, called Serene Velocity that some of you may have seen that's like uh, quite astonishing uh, to watch and has a lot of the kind of central visual qualities that I was really interested in. And it's coming, in, uh, coming up in connection with this so-called structural film, and I thought, well, oh, yeah, this is good, this is pretty cool, you know, so, so it, 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 I, I became acclimated, I became acclimated, and then when I began to teach, I realized that a more focused engagement with these materials was really something that, that I could afford, you know, because if, if I wasn't, te before I taught, I really just lived in my loft in New York and, uh, in fact, increasingly didn't even go out of the house. I liked, uh, Beverly and I um, got to the point on 42nd Street where we uh, just went out once a week for groceries, you know, I and mean, we stayed in the house and we would uh, allow our day to drift later and later so we didn't, we didn't have to get up at any particular time, so we just like get up later each day and had a, like a 27 hour day. And, uh, you know, a week later we'd go out and get groceries, you know, so it was like, we, there was no reason to like or dislike anything. <laughs> like a cultural vacuum. And, um, but, but as, a, as a teacher, I became involved with other people and sets of values and showing things, examining things, looking at things. I, and I found that very exciting and it did change me and I was very, I, I found this extremely rewarding and interesting. So I, I changed a great deal at that point, I think, yeah. And film feedback was actually made 
I mean, we yeah. have assistance of students. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, we thought of uh, film, ba I, would, I would thought of film feedback at a certain point as uh, something, as a team thing <laughs> that we should go on, we should take it on the road, you know, and like do it as a lot, you know, like, we haven't made the film yet, but we're going to make it as we show it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you made several versions, a couple. Of well, I, the first time I shot it, um, it was shot on a, it was shot off a screen. You, uh, you, you may recall from the diagram that uh, uh, Brandon uh, presented uh, briefly, uh, I mean, Professor, uh, no, he didn't, uh, that uh, uh, this was actually uh, shot uh, uh, from, uh, by a uh, camera that uh, faced directly into a projector, uh, except there was a little tiny screen in between that was sort of set in the window of a dark room. And so the, the image was just uh, this high, and the only thing that tips you off to that is the fact there's a candle in the frame, so you can see how big it is. And so it was very bright, and this allowed us to use cheap film. <laughs> Otherwise, would it cost too much? How many feet of film from the uh, camera gate to the projector? Gate? About 18. About, about 18 feet of film, yeah, it was a pretty tight loop. Um, so, uh, the, but the first time we did it, it wasn't set up like that. It was shot, it, it was projected on a screen and shot off the screen. And the idea was that then there could be an audience that could actually watch this happening. Uh, but nothing came out. So it didn't really work. So, so much for that. <laughs> The audience is the first thing to go. The audience is the first thing to go. Yeah. It was actually one of the students who suggested putting the candle in the film, which I thought was just a stroke of genius, actually. Should we take his question? Sure. How did you make straight and narrow? Um, you know, comparing yeah. it to how you made the flicker. Well, uh, this is a little technical. Sorry, everybody. Uh, I'll make it as quick as possible. When you uh, uh, print a film, what you usually do is you have a, a machine that runs two pieces of film together like this, and they're sort of like squeezed together, so they're emulsion to emulsion, kissing like that. And then the, there's a, it's like a projector, and there's a little light that shines on the film that passes in front of the light, and this exposes the film, the raw film with the negative or the original film so that it's sort of like the shadow of the film you already have is cast onto the raw film that you didn't develop yet. And, this is, and then you develop that film and so forth. Now what you can do also is you can uh, uh, just, you don't have to just use one piece of film. You can stack them up. And if you stack them up then you can shine it through more than one. The trick is then how you get them to line up because, you know, I mean, uh, very, some very interesting films have been made by just taking strips of film and laying them out on the floor in the dark and putting another piece of film on top and then you just turn the light on for a second or like get a flashlight even and just like, you know, make, the, make your print like that and then you develop it and see what happens. And, they go, oh my God, you know, like, and the sprocket holes will wander all over the film, and I mean, it's like, whoa, crazy. So, um, but uh, I was very interested in this idea of using bipack, that is, taking two layers of film and <clears throat> printing them both at the same time onto, the, onto another one. And I realized that uh, this would be a way to impart flicker to another film. Is I could take my film to Flickr, you see, and put it together with another film, and then just print them both at the same time, and of course, the Flickr would then block out uh, the half the images, say, you know, so that it would come out flickering. And I thought, cool, you know, like that was a part of the plan, actually, was that I had several reasons for making the Flickr, and one of them was this uh, crazy idea I had that. I could sort of somehow like copyright the patterns, you know, and then I would own them. 
And I can use them like this to produce other uh, material. So this was made in that way. You know, like I, I took the film, bypacked it with a, a, a uh, with a, uh, mm, like a uh, flicker that uh, just allowed one image, one frame in six to come out and then put stripes on it. So I put, in other words, then I put, I was putting one, the uh, stripes on one frame in six. But were you putting the stripes on the frames or were you, I, I mean, I, I guess what I'm not clear on is, you know, is there ever a camera involved in any of this? Well, I, I shot uh, some just st st still pictures of, I mean, just like, you know, st steady pictures of the stripes. <laughs> Just so yeah. I have the stripes, okay, and then horizontal stripes and vertical stripes, and in fact, vertical and horizontal stripes, positive and negative, just by displacing it a little bit. So then I had four, basically four kinds of shots, and then um, so then I take a film, a, a, a loop. I used a loop that was black, 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 clear, black, 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 clear like that. And so it's just going to print one frame in every six. And I would use that to print, you know, like the orange frames. Then I would go back and print some, you know, on the next frame down. So I had to keep track of where I was in my six frame system. And finally then I go in and just kill three out of the six, you know, with black. And that's how it was made, yeah. And this took like a lot of passes over the over the uh, uh, original film. So, I mean, really, I printed that film. One, two, three, well, you know, like I, I printed it like four times, uh, three, 12, 13 times. You know, one, one, for the, one for this, one for this, one for this, one for this, on each of the three frames, that's, and, then the, and then the flicker. So it was like a bunch of, work. <laughs> and, and did you use the original flicker rhythm? Like you well, yeah. supposed to? Well, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had this whole library of this uh, flicker <laughs> stuff, so, you know, just as I planned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were your first victim. Yeah. It, for, uh, when you think of uh, your work, could you define uh, the word medium? Holy smoke. <laughs> you mean like um, in a uh, very uh, specific sense that, that I would be using or? Sure. Hmm. I think a medium is um, a um, uh, is uh, for me, it's an intermediary uh, that's not um, specifically la language, you know, in creating a, a cultural uh, entity, object. Is that fair? Well, like paint or film or whatever, you know. But I think one of the when things. When you say that language, you mean like words? Yeah. Because you know, with with all the writing and our esteemed visitor here, um, you know that we have uh, you know there's the language of everything, you know, uh, and the language of film and, and but I I tune I tune into your work as being uh, uh, purposely disruptive. Yeah, good. Um, yeah. Of uh, <laughs> of uh, um, it, you know, I can't think of any other thing to say but like connected communication. Uh huh. You know, and uh, yeah. You know, I've, I, I've always, you know, watched your work for a long time, and I've always noticed no. connections in the disconnections, and I you know, know, connections to uh, um, a lot of what uh, um, the little that I've read about uh, Derrida, it, it talks about that that the narrative is is leaking, you know, and there's all, your work always seems to have this leakage going on. <laughs> 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 Fix the plumbing. <laughs> well, I think uh, maybe I would respond to that by saying that, um, well, maybe I would say that uh, 
I, um, I, have, I, have, I tend to have a habit of, of uh, going at things in a negative way. You know, like, uh, like he'll, he'll say something and I'll think, like, how could that not, not be true? <laughs> <laughs> and um, you'll be the book. So I've been, um, I, I thought, he came up with this idea that uh, the flicker was interesting, uh, for example, in the way that it, uh, it did not specifically reside in the medium of film. And uh, in, the, in the sense that there was a great interest at this time in painting as painting, and the canvas as the canvas, and the film as film materially, and all this kind of thing, that, that the flicker, on the other hand, had very little to do with being a film, but was actually something that could inhabit, you know, any convenient realm, and actually had much more to do with the eyeball and the brain than it did with the medium of film. And I thought, yeah, that's very interesting. I like that idea. And in that sense, this sort of like then uh, takes the question of medium and puts it in a very relative framework, you know, so that that's why I'm sort of like wondering how to answer that question because I'm not sure where I would, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I can define it, you know, because it seems like it stretches out in in an unruly way. And then uh, the other way of answering that question is to just say that, and I mean, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm always trying to encourage people to think negatively, you know, but I, I, to be, uh, you know, to be questioning, you know, uh, and especially fundamental uh, principles like we should go into a rack, <laughs> you know, like, wait, why should we go into a rack? That's a good thing to think, you know, and maybe we shouldn't go into a rack or, you know, this kind of thing. So, um, but also uh, to um, uh, problematize these things and then to figure out ways to use that negative energy to construct uh, um, mm, what, what, you, what I would have called in the, my math uh, identity a counterexample, you know. You know, let's so say you go outside the space of the territory that's explored and, and try and construct something that challenges that. Now one of the things that actually uh, uh, intrigued me about film is that um, I have been uh, uh, very uh, in, uh, sort of uh, not... Um, not uh, happy about uh, um, art as an institution. I felt that I've, uh, I've, I've been, I, I've, come, I've developed a, a line of thinking in which uh, uh, I felt uh, there were real problems about culture and entertainment and all of this, and particularly where they related to the institutional continuity of these things and the investment of attitudes and values in a strain, a, in a strain of cultural identities, you know, like, um, I guess, you know, really, a part of it came for me out of uh, hating the idea of a music teacher. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just putting it in familiar terms, you know, like how uh, the piano teacher tortures you, <laughs> you know, like, to heck with that, why not just bang on the piano, and I mean, what is, and, no, you should do it right, you know, well, we learn, this right thing is everything you have to deconstruct later, you know, like, I mean, hey, you know, like, free music, you know, like, I mean, it, it takes years to overcome it. Yeah, and all of this, you see, so, um, uh, so, um, so, uh, for, I mean, but then you can extend this much further, much further, you know, and so I, I felt that film was an area where, because there were no rewards, <laughs> Uh, there was uh, a kind of open field. You could do negative things, positive things, and it was uh, there was a great, a much more um, liability, labit, labile quality. You know, like you could slither across boundaries and not be affected. Uh, and part of the reason for that was that uh, that at the time when I got involved in the '60s. Um, the movie industry was much tighter than it is today. You know, like uh, the idea of becoming a movie director was way off the charts. You know, like for example, at that time, I was told that to be a 
the Hollywood cinematographer, you needed to be a blood relative of a living member of the union. You know, so it was it was sewn up. You know, it was really tight. So. <laughs> You want to keep going? I was just curious that the sound to the flicker seemed to have a sort of equal role in its hallucinatory yeah, effect. Yeah, yeah. And I was just curious how you arrived at it. Maybe if you could comment on its relationship to the, the light and the image. Okay. Um, but let's say, uh, because uh, I, I'm sympathetic to the people who are, put, who are taken off. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's getting late, right? Yeah, and yeah. it's a long program. I don't want to keep you uh, here captive to a rant, you know. But um, see, here's another thing I didn't like. I didn't like synthesizers. I thought, how come the damn engineers are telling us what to do? You know? I thought, how come the engineers get to have the fun? You know, they make it up and they say, oh, well, it should be like this. And they design it so that it's like the circuits do certain kind of things and then they let, I mean, I, I, I knew a couple of synthesizers at the time, one at least at the time, and, and I thought, geez, that doesn't do anything like what I'm interested in. And I had this idea, a, a synthesizer should be the, the work, that that's like a score. I felt this, it's like a score in hardware. See, so I thought, okay, I want to make this uh, soundtrack for this piece, you know, and I'm uh, into music, and I want to, I think I'll make it as a hardware piece, you know. So I built a gizmo, you know, that would do the kind of things that I wanted it to do. You know, I wanted it to uh, use uh, pulses uh, because I wanted it to animate the space and uh, that kind of thing. And I wanted it to occupy this uh, territory between uh, sound and, between uh, rhythm and pitch. Uh, that is to go into this realm of, uh, of activity around uh, 20 to 30, 40 cycles uh, or, uh, or events per second. And uh, so that's what I did. And it seemed to have a specific relationship to the cadence of the flicker itself, or, or was that a random juxtaposition? Uh, yeah. It was. Yeah, it's random. In fact, tonight I was playing uh, the soundtrack off a of CD because uh, it's stereo, and a, a sound on film isn't very nice, and this was like, I thought it sounded really beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the original composition was stereo? The original is stereo, yeah. 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 You know, this is something maybe for both you and Brandon, you know, what, what would be the relationship of, of your films to war? Well, at that time, I didn't like Warhol's films because I thought it was uh, like a big rip-off of our sort of like long-duration stuff that we were doing. But I, I've thought differently about that too since then. And mm -hmm. there's a uh, interesting documentary out on uh, Warhol uh, that's run on PBS lately uh, that's the, the, that sort of makes it look very, very nice. And the only problem with that is that some of the nicest footage is footage of uh, Mario Montez, and he's not even credited in the documentary. I mean, like what they say, like, hey, these creatures are weirdos, and they show Mario, who was, was a wonderful person, and I thought, what's, what's the problem here? They never credit the actors, which has been a big sort of like bone in the throat of uh, Taylor Mead, and, and, uh, and also I had to listen to a lot of rants from Andine, and, Rob Rita and the turtle and all the whole the whole mess of freaks around that scene about that, but but I'm not answering that question. I'll leave that for uh, Brandon because he's got great answers. To <laughs> you, but the, the question is about the relationship of the two. Well, just you know, because you sort of started with with the clinical thing, versus the you, aesthetic, well, and then I and guess then the I guess but there's just, lots to say on either of those. But. Sure, but I, I'm really just thinking about. You know, two two New York underground mm -hmm. filmmakers who couldn't be further from Hollywood, you know, yeah, yeah. and yet, uh, you know, probably, you know, kind of uniquely yeah. within that whole milieu, I, they're I, both targeting 
you know, their ambitions to being I on think par the, with Hollywood. I think the, connect, the connector to that is Jack Smith. Yeah, yeah that's a good and it's, it's funny because I've worked on, I mean, I've worked on Warhol sure. quite a lot. I've published, you know, three or four things on Warhol's films, particularly. I mean, um, and it, it's funny because I found, like, I could do, you know, Robert Rauschenberg and Andy Warhol, and I could do Robert Rauschenberg and, and you know, do whatever, um, Robert Whitman or whatever I work on. And I found it extremely difficult to go between Warhol and Tony. Mm -hmm. And it was because it, it was sort of like, I would, it would take me a long time when I started, when I, you know, if I went from, you know, doing a Warhol article and then going back to the book, it would take me a long time to stop either seeing in Warhol everything I saw in Tony, or seeing in Tony everything I saw in Warhol. And it was almost, but, but it's like everything's very close, but yet it's totally, right? It's like you have to go through the mirror to the other side, and then like everything's different. And, um, but the connector is really, I think, is Jack Smith, which is where Tony first really encountered film as something other than the movies. Very much. Right? And it's yeah. also, you know, where Warhol first encountered film as something <coughs> other than the movies. You know, I mean, Warhol's first film, as you know, is, uh, but maybe some of the people don't, is Warhol's first film is Jack Smith filming Normal Love, which is the film that, that was originally going to have flicker effects in it. Wait, what, did, that was before, but he made Sleep and Eat and all of those before no, that. No. Really? He shot the first film. The first film he shot was was um, was uh, Andy Warhol filming Jack Smith. Is that right? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, that's the first. That's where was that? Film. Where did he shoot? Where was that? He, he shot that up in Old Lime, or it was where the cake sequence. Really? Was. Oh yeah. my God! I and didn't it's know the reason nobody knows that film anymore is because right. one of the times they came to raid Jack Smith's friendly flaming creatures, the police seized Warhol's film instead, and Warhol <laughs> was shooting um, reversal. You know, so, really? he's, so he's shooting reversal film, so he's just, he's showing the originals because they're reversal and it's films, gone. right? And it's gone or it's sitting in some police evidence lab in New York somewhere. Wow. <laughs> Still to this day. So um, so it didn't really, huh. you know. But that was the that's the first thing that he shows before Kiss, really, which is before he shoots Tarzan and Jane, which is out in L.A., which is which is mm -hmm. he's working on Sleep all this time, but he, he, the Sleep doesn't get shown until. Well, I was there. I'm surprised I didn't uh, see him hang around. Well, yeah, but I was busy being the mummy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't hang out so in that way. But if you read, and Tony's actually the first person to put me onto this. I mean, and now I teach it. I mean, many, many years ago when I first met Tony, which is ten or eleven years ago now. Um, but um, it, you know, in those very first writings by Smith, I mean, which you know well, I'm sure perfect filmic appositeness of Maria Montez and belated appreciation of V.S., which is Paul Sternberg, there's so much of Warhol's aesthetic in there, um, and, but also so much that's not. Uh, and in some ways, what's not ends up, in some sense, in, in the flicker. And one of the things, uh, which I don't even know if Tony remembers, but you know, what Pierre and Sidney says is the thing that makes this a structural film is its shape and its overall unity. And the actual thing that Tony says long before Pierre, he says, I was looking for an overall unity of structure in this film, something like Jack Smith's coloristic formalism, which is, which is the way that Jack Smith codes each of the sequences of normal love with a different color. Um, and so that, which becomes static form and all of these things, which is, I mean, you almost think it's so close to what P. Adams later says, that's why he doesn't cite it. It's right there next to what he's citing, but he doesn't sort of cite it. Um, so I really, I think that, that Smith is, the, is, the, is, that, is that connector. And it's unfortunate now that the, the state is all you know, messed up, that we can't really do serious work on Smith at the moment. But. There's another uh, weird person involved in that connection uh, who's really forgotten, and that's Naomi Levine. Mm -hmm. Na Naomi Levine was uh, somebody who was hanging around the Warhol scene, and then she uh, she was she she what her artwork was was she would just draw flowers on the wall and all over the place, and 
And, and so then the next thing Andy Warhol does is he makes these paintings of flowers. And uh, but, so, you know, like she had a, an, a, an effect this way, which pissed her off enormously. And she made movies, too. And she made, she was a filmmaker, and she was the one who brought Jack up to Andy's loft. Yeah, yeah, that, so that's how Tarzan and Jane Regain sort of came into being, was that it was through, I think actually that, that she was shooting a movie, and there was some kind of crossover that happened. It could be, that, uh, unfortunately, I don't know but she was very responsible for this. It was, uh, yeah. Really but she unfortunately at one point took all of her films uh, out of mm -hmm. anthology and they're all gone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So as far, unless one turns up in the canisters in anthology, which does happen, um, actually, um, that she demanded them all back from the co-op and from anthology and took them, they all disappeared. She was homeless for a while, actually. Yeah, she, she was uh, unstable, uh, had some mental uh, difficulties or something at a certain time, you know, which a lot of people do, but I mean, it was too bad that, uh, that she didn't keep it together in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, but so that's a piece that we may not get back, mm -hmm. actually, those antiquarians. Andy asked me if I would do uh, sound for his films at one point. Oh, Tony, would you? And I said, I didn't really think so, because I really didn't, I wasn't interested in the approach that he had, which was much too casual for me. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's see, what can we say that's really like a, just a stem winder here? <laughs> Thanks. Especially happy that Brandon came from New York to do this. Like, uh,